Well, I wonder what you do when you are facing a challenge. How do you keep going? We all have challenges in life, don't we? We can maybe look back to times when we've sat exams. Maybe we've gone through the challenge of childbirth. Maybe we've set ourselves new challenges this year. Exercise, getting through that pain barrier. Maybe you've thought of, uh, you can remember trying to climb a mountain to get to the top to see that wonderful view. That's a challenge, isn't it? And there might even be somebody here who has run a marathon. Anybody run a marathon? Half marathon? No? I haven't either, don't worry. <laughs> Maybe you've moved to a new place and you can remember that challenge of walking into the playground with your children on the first day of school and you know that it's hard for them but it's actually hard for you too as a mum. Maybe you've moved to a new country and you've had to navigate a different road system or you've felt the eyes of others on you as you've made <coughs> cultural faux pas and maybe you've had the sadness of walking into a church for the funeral of a loved one. There are many challenges in life, aren't they? Aren't there? And some we've all experienced. And there are challenges that face us as Bible-believing Christian women in the 21st century. The challenge begins for us when we turn to Christ and we tell others that we are following him. Maybe you've had ridicule from your family. Maybe there's been that silence that you have betrayed them when you became a Christian. And then there are the challenges that affect us in ministry, aren't there? You might be worn out. You might be tired of serving. You might feel that there's little fruit. Maybe your husband's struggling in leadership for all sorts of reasons. And maybe deep down you wonder, is the sacrifice worth it? Well, the letter to the Hebrews was written to Jewish believers and they were facing challenges of their own and they were tempted to give up. They had become Christians. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 32 <coughs> describes them as having received the light. But they were experiencing suffering and it was hard for them to keep going. The book of Hebrews, the letter of Hebrews, warns them against drifting away in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. They were tempted to return to Judaism and to think that it had more to offer than Christianity. They were looking back to the Old Testament, to Moses, Joshua, to Aaron and Mel Melchizedek. And their situ situation was perilous because they were in danger of letting go of all the riches they had in Christ. Now, I don't think any of us here will be thinking of returning to Judaism but we can face a similar temptation to drift away. And maybe we wonder, is it worth holding on to faith in Christ? What makes believing in Christ worthwhile? What can we hold on to when we're beginning to think, is being a Christian really worth it? Is serving Christ worth the sacrifices I make as a woman in ministry alongside my husband? Are there firm places for me to put my feet when I'm swimming against the tide? So let's think of some of the challenges that we face as Christian women in the 21st century. Imagine Susan. She's a mum of three children at primary school. And she realises that her children are being taught that God didn't make us male and female, but we're on a spectrum. And it's okay to choose whether you're a boy or whether you're a girl. 
according to how you feel about yourself. Susan felt she was ready for these questions when her children reached secondary school, but they're only four, five and seven. What about Sarah? She has recently become a Christian while at university and her parents are appalled that their daughter has embraced what they consider to be a philosophy which equates with intellectual suicide. Then there's Sandra. She's married to a man in ministry and she is concerned that he's nearing burnout. He works so hard and yet the church isn't able to pay him a living wage. She works part-time to supplement their income, but she feels unappreciated at home, at work and in the church. And she doesn't read her Bible very often. And she knows her heart is cool towards the Lord. She feels on the edge of the church when she should be at the heart of it. Sheila has seen a lot of suffering in her own family. And she feels hopeless as not one of her four adult children have trusted the Lord. If they don't turn to Christ, they'll not be saved and she can't bear the thought of what eternity will be like for them. It seems easier not to believe what the Bible teaches about heaven and hell. And then there's Sonia. She served overseas for 20 years in a Muslim country and she hasn't seen one woman come to Christ. So much seed sowing. Was it worth it? Can she really believe that women who are so ardent about their Islamic faith will not receive any reward for being so sincere? These are a few of the challenges that are distinctive to being a Christian and a Christian woman in the 21st century. Challenges of secularism, pluralism, challenges to the biblical position of sexuality and gender, the holding out of the pursuit of pleasure above other things. Sometimes being a Christian brings scorn. And true Christianity is seen by many as irrelevant or bigoted and narrow-minded. We are the heretics who don't conform to society and its norms. If we added up those in our churches and compared the answer to how many people go shopping or play sport on a Sunday morning, we would have to recognise that the Christian church is in the minority in the UK. When we feel small and insignificant, it's easy to begin to think that we are wrong. Is it worth persevering? Should I be holding on? What or who should I hold on to? And that's why this book is so important and so relevant to us today. The letter to the Hebrews is all about fixing our thoughts on Jesus. Hebrews 3 verse 1. Looking to Christ and understanding his uniqueness, his sonship, his superiority, why he came to earth and what he accomplished in his life, his death and his resurrection. The Hebrews were not to drift away and neither are we. The Christian life may be hard, there are challenges. It is unpopular, there is persecution, but don't give up. Christ is better than anything, any other religion or philosophy has to offer. He is the best. And we're going to find out why this afternoon. Don't drift away. Don't give up. Make sure you are holding on. Hebrews 10 is such a wonderful passage. Verses 19 to 39, which we'll look at today and tomorrow, apply what the first nine chapters have been teaching. Hebrews 10 verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. When things threaten to knock us off course, when we are tempted to despair, Hebrews 10 gives us confidence, direction 
and help to persevere. There's a picture on the front of your handout of a woman climbing a rock face. I'm not a climber. I haven't done this. I did think when I was preparing, perhaps I should go to one of those climbing walls and just have a go, but I don't like heights, so I thought I'll just stick with the the preparation rather than getting my mind around what it's like to climb a rock face. But I can imagine, if you're climbing a rock face, you have to search for those handholds and those footholds. And Hebrews 10 gives us three strong, (coughs) secure footholds so that we can hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, as we're told in verse 23. So the first foothold that we have is complete cleansing in Christ, verses 19 to 22. So verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Complete cleansing in Christ. Now we're all women here. One of our chores, our jobs, is to clean. I expect you've seen mould. Mould growing. Student houses. I've had two daughters who've lived in student houses. Mould growing on walls in a damp, dark property. You walk in, you look around, The black mould has spread over the walls, maybe on the ceilings a bit, maybe it's round the window frames, and there's that musty smell in the air. You turn your nose up and you think about how much bleach and scrubbing is going to be needed to make an impact and how many hours it's going to take to get rid of that black dirt that is so ingrained. Well... Your heart and mind is like this, and mine is too. Sin has affected and pervaded every part of our beings, our minds, our conscience, our will, and our actions are blackened. And we require cleansing. And we can't do this ourselves. To have a relationship with the Holy God, our sin needs to be removed. We need a deep clean. We each should cringe when God shines his holy spotlight on our lives. When we remember sins that we have committed which bring us shame and pain. And even presently we want to hide from God's all-seeing eyes. Sin so adversely affects our own lives, our relationships with those we love and our desire to know God. Knowledge of sin is vital as it highlights our need for cleansing in Christ. Knowing our need drives us to Christ. In the Old Testament, the high priest on the Day of Atonement sprinkled the blood of a bullock and a goat on the atonement cover of the Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Place. Before entering the Most Holy Place on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had to bathe himself in water. This ritual was symbolic of the need for moral cleansing and inner purity. And such sacrifices were designed to remind the people of their sin and to show them that there was a need for forgiveness. But the sacrifices under the old covenant didn't provide complete cleansing. They weren't able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. If you look back to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. 
It says, this is an illustration of the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. And verse 14 of the same chapter then goes on to give us the wonderful news. (coughs) How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Sisters, the cleansing that Christ offers isn't symbolic, ceremonial, merely external, but it's deep. It's right to our hearts and our minds and our conscience. It's an inward cleansing, Verse 22 tells us that in, in our passage, Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We can rejoice that cleansing comes through the wants for all sacrifice of Christ and it is complete and it is permanent and that's why we're able to sing what we've sung already that no condemnation now we dread Jesus and all in him is mine we are free from accusation because Christ has died for us Hebrews 9.22 tells us, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. But Christ's blood has been shed, and his blood cleanses us. We are forgiven and we are made pure. Think back to that mould. Your sin, my sin, it is gone. It has been cleansed. A deep clean has taken place through the blood of Christ. And don't our hearts want to say, praise his name. You might have sung, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You and I are here today, cleansed sinners, permanently made clean from our sin by the work of Jesus. And doesn't that fill our hearts with thankfulness, joy and confidence? So the first firm foothold of what we have in Christ is complete cleansing. The second foothold is immediate access to God. Verses 21 and 22. Verse 21 says, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. On the basis of who Christ is, verse 21, and what he has done, we are to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, verse 22. You and I are encouraged to come into God's presence, into his holy presence. We have immediate access to God. Jesus is the great high priest and he is just what we need. Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16, verses which I'm sure are very familiar to you, say, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So this great high priest, Jesus himself, is just like us in every way. He's able to sympathise with us in our weaknesses, and he was tempted 
just as we are, but he was without sin. Imagine you're at work and you have a difficult meeting coming up. Or maybe you have a difficult meeting with another sister in the church. You feel insecure, you feel ill-equipped, you maybe feel faint-hearted, you maybe feel underconfident. How do you feel when you are told that there has been a pre-meeting and all the groundwork has been laid? Those issues which you were not looking forward to talking about have been put on the table, they've been discussed and a way forward has been agreed. You now feel relieved. You feel thankful. Going into that meeting that you anticipated would be difficult is now a different prospect. You feel confident. Jesus, the ultimate high priest, has opened up the new and living way for us into God's holy presence. Verse 20. He has gone through the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Hebrews 10 verse 10 says, We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And therefore you and I are able to approach the throne of God with confidence so that we can receive that mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is our great high priest. He is our substitute. He is our representative. He is our mediator and our intercessor. And therefore we can sing, Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Because of Christ's completed work of redemption and his ongoing work of intercession, we can draw near to God with boldness and confidence. And this was something that the worshippers couldn't do under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. Then only one man, the high priest, in one place, the tabernacle, and then only once a year could draw near. In stark contrast, now anyone can draw near to God through Christ, anywhere and at any time. We have that immediate access. We don't need to wait to go to God. We can go now. We can go any time, middle of the night, first thing in the morning, any time we can go into God's presence. That new and living way was opened up and Christ is now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at Hebrews 10 verses 11 and 12. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Isn't that wonderful? Now I mentioned that I love the sunshine. You might love sunshine too. I think most of us do, don't we? And January is a cold month. And sometimes it can feel cold, not just in the weather, but it can feel a bit cold and grey emotionally for us too as well. Christmas has passed with the warmth of celebrations and January can feel a bit bleak. That's why coming here, I'm sure, it just is so lovely. Imagine you go to visit a friend in the middle of a dank, dark, foggy day. And you're just calling in to maybe drop off a rotor or a letter or something. And she opens the door and she immediately says, Oh, you must be cold. Come on inside. And she takes you into the hall. 
But then she takes you into the living room and you see there's a lovely fire there, a real fire with the flames and it's roaring and it's warm. And she says, pull up a chair, I'm going to go and put the kettle on. You draw near, don't you? Verse 22 of Hebrews 10 tells us to draw near. Let's draw near to God. And drawing near to God brings <coughs> benefits to us. By drawing near, we are coming into God's very presence. We're told to come with a sincere heart. And God is always concerned about our hearts. In ministry, we can sometimes feel um, that we have to keep up appearances. And we maybe feel the pressure to wear that bright smile and to sing heartily, even if our hearts aren't right there. But don't pretend. When you draw near to God, don't pretend. God sees right to our hearts. Ladies, we can't dress to impress before God. We mustn't keep up a pretense. But we come humbly expressing our need of Christ and our dependence upon him. There are many lovely things about the job that I do at the moment, supporting women in ministry. But one of the sad things is that sometimes I hear more about moral failure in ministry than I would want to. And aren't all of our hearts hard? We are all prone to sin. I don't know if you've read this book or seen it, Dangerous Calling, by Paul David Tripp. And I read this last year. And Tripp writes about the need for the gospel to keep continually penetrating our hearts. And he tells us something of the practical ways in which we can ensure that there is a reality in our walk with the Lord. And this encouragement to draw near to God keeps us close to our Lord and Saviour. It keeps us walking with Christ. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy. When we come sincerely, we also have full assurance of faith. The New King James Version of Ephesians 1, 6 says, We are accepted in the Beloved. We draw near to God, resting completely on Christ, and we draw near in the name of Jesus. Prayer is that immense privilege. Access into God's presence is to be prized and also practised. So let me ask you, what is your prayer life like? What things do you pray for? How often do you pray? Do you have times of outpouring of your heart to God in prayer? What weighs on your mind, perhaps family, friends, the lost around you, the challenges of ministry? Do you turn quickly to commit cares and concerns to the Lord in prayer? Remember, we have that access any time. Do you cast your burdens on him? Do you pray for your own walk with the Lord? Do you pray for your husband in his own devotional life as well as in his ministry? Sometimes, if we're honest, perhaps we try to press on in our own strength and try to cope by gritting our teeth and simply <coughs> working hard. So don't serve without prayer and fellowship with the Lord. If we do that, we are battling away in the cold rather than basking in the warmth of God's presence and knowing his blessings and the benefits of drawing near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. When I worked for UFM, I travelled to Moldova and it was one of those trips uh, that really stands out for me. And... I don't know if any of you have read this book, um, written by Maureen Wise, With God, All Things Are Possible. And I went to see the work that Maureen was doing there in Moldova. And she'd been working in Moldova since before the fall of communism. 
and she worked with men and women who uh, lived in these closed institutions and experienced immense cruelty and deprivation. She set up uh, four houses for some of those uh, folks who were in these uh, closed institutions to come and live in. And while I was there, what I experienced was a habitual and purposeful drawing near to the Lord in prayer. Every morning, it was their practice to kneel and to pray for an hour. And they expressed their need to God, their dependence upon him to work. And the book describes amazing answers to prayer. Huge obstacles were overcome, massive material provision was made, and hard hearts of those in authority were melted, and men and women came to Christ. Do I believe, do we believe that prayer changes things? If we do, we will take every opportunity to draw near. I read an interesting article uh, recently that Tim Keller wrote on praying without ceasing. And uh, he said, like many believer, other believers, I've always sought to have a time of devotion and prayer each morning. And like most other believers, I found it a struggle to be consistent. He says, imagine my surprise when I came across a place in John Calvin's Institutes where he argues that when it comes to daily prayer, once is not enough. Calvin points to the exhortation to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, and says that, of course, every Christian should aspire to pray to God constantly through the day. But he adds, since our weakness is such that it has to be supported by many aids and our sluggishness such that it needs to be goaded, it is fitting each one of us should set apart certain hours for this exercise. And Calvin said that we should designate set times, though brief, during which all the devotion of the heart should be completely engaged. And he pr proposed five times a day. Waking in the morning before work, at the midday meal, after the meal or after the day's work, and then getting ready for bed at night. And he said that it mustn't be a superstitious observing of hours. Um, it was challenging to me. <coughs> Sometimes it's hard enough to maintain the discipline of reading my Bible and praying every morning. I should be praying more and more through the day. And Keller talks about writing prayers. So let me ask you, what would help you more often to draw near to God in prayer. Perhaps writing prayers might help you. Where do we go? We all have needs. We all have challenges. The Christian life is one where we must pers persevere and keep holding it on. So make sure that we are drawing near, that we are going into God's presence. So that second foothold is immediate access to God. And then the third foothold is the encouragement of other believers, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that we must spur one another on to love and good deeds and not give up meeting together and encourage one another. Perhaps you think, I don't give up meeting together. I don't really have an option. I have to be there. I don't have an option not to go to meetings. Serving in the congregation is what we do, isn't it, as women in ministry? Surely I'm encouraging others. And there are many, many ways in which we encourage other women in church life. We listen, we counsel, we advise, we pray, we help women in their life of faith. And we might do this practically too. Many women are gifted in providing meals and hospitality, serving others, babysitting, taking folks to the hospital, 
visiting the sick and the elderly and opening up God's word with women and helping them to hold on to those promises. But these verses should make us take a step back. They begin with the words, let us consider how. And considering how begins with thoughts and attitudes, doesn't it? So let me ask ourselves a few questions. (coughs) Is my practical service spirit-led and thoughtful? Is my goal, is the goal of my interaction with others that they may grow (coughs) in love for the Lord and in love for others? Do I seek to encourage those closest to me? In my family, my husband, my children, if I've been blessed with them. How am I promoting the spiritual well-being of those in the church family? Where are my eyes fixed when I listen to the preaching of the word? Am I purposeful in my interaction with others? And do I seek to prayerfully understand their needs so I am able to encourage them? And how can I value meeting together more? A lot of that is outward looking, isn't it? What can we do to encourage one another? But I want to also ask, who are you allowing to minister to you in this way? As women in ministry, we often think more about what we do rather than about how we receive. And Tripp has a chapter in Dangerous Calling um, entitled Joints and Ligaments, in which he challenges those in ministry that they must not put themselves above or over the church membership. The church has only one head, and that is Christ himself. We're all part of the body. You and I are part of the body alongside our fellow believers. We need to receive encouragement from others. We need to be part of that body of Christ. And we need to be as honest as we can with the right people about our own struggles. We need to be spurred on too. Meeting together is synonymous for doing life together and applying the word we hear preached to our inner being. Do we do this? Do we allow others to minister to us? We need to be doing this more and more, don't we? We need to be growing in fellowship more and more. We're told at the end of verse uh, 25 not to give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The incentive and the constant longing and expectation is that one day Christ is going to return and then our faith will be turned to sight. These last few verses remind us that we are persevering with others The encouragement of other Christians is another firm foothold for us to persevere in the Christian life. But before I close, I want to turn again to verse 23, the verse right in the middle of our section. It says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, because he who promised is faithful. So we have these three firm footholds, complete cleansing, immediate access, and the encouragement of other believers, because God, who promised, is faithful. God is with us. He will not fail us. His promises are certain. We do have the firmest footholds, but even better, we have his complete and utter faithfulness. He who promised is faithful. His everlasting arms are underneath us. Deuteronomy 23, 27. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath 
are the everlasting arms. And let's